Well, welcome to the podcast, Dan. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. It's uh, it's great to be on. As I was saying before, it's you've been a bit of a hero of mine throughout sports science the past few years. So it's yeah, it's great to chat. And how about yourself? How are you doing? Oh, oh yeah, really good, really good. Um, I think I've, I've probably got four years practice now of the summers being quieter now that I'm independent. Um, so before that, it was 21 years worth of summers being really busy and f- frenetic. So. Um, I'm just getting used to it quietening at this time. So yeah, all good. All right. So, um, I want to, I want to dive into a load of, um, different ideas, particularly, uh, based around your book around engineering and what for me going through it actually bordered on sort of social dynamics and, <laughs> uh, engineering, engineering how we live as much as anything. But, uh, first question up is how's the washing up ability going? <laughs> um i'd still not improved to be honest too much it's been low down on the focus it's been out of my top five items on the to-do list so it's not received quite as much attention as it, as it probably should but i'm quite lucky um we have a good dishwasher and that's that's featured heavily since we moved out of the team house so doing well off that all right so for context there i love the, the top trumps idea that you explore in the in the book and um, that idea of of simple profiling and maybe we can get into the um, can you can you just give us a bit of a background uh, for people who might not know you could you just sort of give us a, a a bit of a history to where you've where you've come from and I guess your journey as much as anything sure I'll, I'll try and summarize as quickly as I can because we can go into a lot of detail in different areas but uh, my background is is most sport engineering I studied uh, undergrad and master's at Oxford Brooks. I always wanted to be in Formula One. That was the dream as a kid. I competed in multiple different motorsport disciplines uh, and just enjoyed the combination of maths, engineering, competition. It all kind of tied in nicely. Uh, I did a a placement year at Mercedes AMG Petronas in the F1 team. So I was in the aero department there uh, back in 2012, 2013. So the Lewis Hamilton, Nico Rosberg era. And kind of figured out there that I didn't want to work in Formula One, which is this weird uh, watershed moment that I actually enjoyed my own sport and doing my own thing more than giving up literally your life and soul to it. It's not that that's necessarily required, but I feel like it's somewhat expected. At least people present that within Formula One, that early starts, late nights, weekends, night shifts, all that kind of stuff is kind of the status quo there. And some people love it. And at my time there, I did, but I also saw that I couldn't do that for the next 10, 20, 30 years. I, there's so many other things going on in my life that I enjoyed. So at the time, my, my cycling and my sport was progressing. I'd started up triathlon. Uh, as a kid, I'd played every sport under the sun and never committed, uh, which I think was probably a blessing in disguise. My parents weren't pushy. They just said, tell us what sports you want to do. And yeah, tennis, football, rugby, squash, swimming, the whole lot. Uh, yeah. Um, so while I was there at Mercedes, I met a guy called Simon Smart, who is quite pop- oh, quite um, renowned, I think, within cycle sport. He was one of the pioneers of aerodynamics and clothing and wheels and bike design. And he kind of pushed me more towards cycle sport aero as opposed to motorsport aero. And I loved it. It was this kind of tying together of my passion in in sport and what I was studying in in engineering. So went back to uni, finished up my my master's and managed to twist the arm of my lecturers to kind of try and take motorsport engineering projects and make them cycle sport relevant. So things like lap time simulators became cycle sport lap time simulators for time trial courses and things like that. So it kind of, yeah, grew my passion even further. I was very lucky that my aero lecturer was a a GB cyclocross rider. So he was pretty happy to... (laughs) to indulge me in that. Uh, so finished up at uni and actually ended up working for a sports consultancy called Pace Insights with Samira B, who you might have mm, come across. Yeah. And I was there for about six months working with a number of different Olympic teams. British athletics was, was my primary focus, but with British equestrian, swimming, uh, kind of all over the place with a lot of different, basically practical applications of engineering within sport, which is exactly what I was enjoying doing and it, it made a lot of sense however at the same time as me doing this my cycling was starting to become a bigger part of my life I was progressing as an athlete I was achieving good results uh domestically I trying to think what year that was, that was 2015 heading 2016 so I was I'd say pretty competitive sort of getting around some of the national level races uh and just becoming more I guess uh competitive at a good level and I kind of thought well what why I'm, I'm helping all these other athletes to, to be competitive internationally. And I want the same kind of 
thing for myself. And mm-hmm. at the time, I kind of made the, the leap of multiple different respects. I, I left Pace Insights. I set my own company up, Watch Shop. So I was sort of doing a combination of um, component design and development, uh, consultancy for others, aerodynamic testing, that kind of thing, to basically take me to races and then to actually race myself and moved up throughout the the echelons domestically uh, for a elite national road team and then this nice um, opportunity came up after I guess six seven months of that where uh, the team at the time I had a, a good friend Charlie Tanfield racing in and he had been on the British Cycling Olympic Development Program as a youth and then wanted to have a go at the individual pursuit of the national track champs which I was pretty keen to have a go at myself it was this beautifully clean scientific event where mm. it's all within your control and it's so easy to model and well you can go you can get make it very complex but it was at the time very simple so I was very keen to have a go and we trained together at Derby sort of late 2016 and at the time we thought well why not do a team pursuit we've got half a squad I'm sure we can find two more <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that's where the the big story started of what became team KGF so I pulled in a friend Johnny Whale from Loughborough Uni who was just finishing up his degree uh, another friend, Jacob Tipper, who was, he came in a bit, I'd say kicking and screaming. He wasn't so keen. He, he saw it as a distraction from his training, but why not? It could be a, a national medal and he might never get one of those in his in his cycling career. So he came in and we had four weeks of preparation into the, the national championships, uh, which we took very seriously. Uh, it was this short, sweet opportunity to apply everything we'd all learned and understood of the sport to quite a top level event. And I was pretty confident from the outset that we could pretty much go in there and win everything. And I guess that's me. Sometimes I'm overconfident and tempered by Tipper, who is the exact opposite. His, his glass is more than half empty. <laughs> so uh, it's good to have that that balance uh, within the team. But yeah, we, we went into nationals having some things a little bit differently preparation and strategy wise on equipment about our own socks for example that have since become pretty popular with with aero socks taking off pretty much across the entire sport and uh yeah myself and charlie we finished one two in the ip then i won the kilo on the second day so we went in as these sort of underdog favorites into the team pursuit and uh qualified fastest and we're against the the bc uh, under 23 academy in the final and pushed them all the way to the line and took the win by 0.4 of a second and the competition record at the same time and that was the big moment i guess we kind of announced ourselves and um wanted to progress and and yeah we were late to the game we weren't in this sort of under 23 can go on the program thing so we were left to our own devices really we didn't get any or much interest from from the national uh, governing body, British Cycling. So we, we went on our, our own way and set up as a trade team so we could go and race at World Cups. Um, that progressed. We, we went to our first World Cup season, had some bad results, and that progressed to some good results, and then finally winning one uh, late in the season. Then through to selection for the World Champs for Commonwealth Games. And it was this kind of big breakthrough season from being nobodies to, especially with Charlie, he was riding hands down the fastest IPs consistently around the world that year. Um, it was kind of a good result if you went below four minutes 20 for an IP. And he rode, I think every IP he did that year, of which there was about seven seven different competitions, so qualifying and finals, they were all 414 or faster. So he was right up there at the top. Uh, and yeah, we just had this, this awesome season. For me, it kind of ended on a low where I didn't really fit in with the GB system. I... I struggled and didn't really uh, didn't really fit for a number of reasons, and I'm sure we can can dive into that throughout throughout this chat. Um, mm. But went on my way a lot more motivated to do things the way I wanted to do them, uh, and to apply my own thoughts and have control over my own destiny. And that that twisted into what became who what bike. So from being a, a small little team, we suddenly have a lot of funding. I say a lot of funding. Our budget for an entire season was, we got it to £60,000 for that year. And that included all equipment, accommodation, training, travel, race entries, a lot. So as, as much as it for us was a lot of money in the grand scheme of things, that was pretty much what a nation would spend on a single World Cup. Um, but money isn't everything. You can do a lot more just using your head. So we, we went on that year and we pretty competitive across every World Cup. We, we won our home one in London, which was massive high for us uh, to have everybody sort of there, all your sponsors. And we, we'd come up with a nation, Darbados, because we didn't feel represented by BC. So we had our own flag. And we're flying the flag of Darbados around London Village Road. So is that, is that a fusion yeah. of Derby and Barbados? Yeah, exactly that. That, so should, got- that should be illegal. That's not, that's not allowed. <laughs> that's, that's not... 
a, a bedfellow. <laughs> well, it is locally. And to be honest, most of our sponsors and partners were, were Derby based. So for them, it was this huge thing that they could shout and scream about. And we had this great flag. We got the flag of Derby or Derbyshire. And uh, we had like the Silk Mill, it's obviously synonymous with Derby. We had the Rolls Royce engine and a couple of yeah. palm trees on it. So it's, yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, and that grew through another season. But then the World Governing Body decided that uh, they were going to ban trade teams. So we were we were out on our asses. We They literally were like, no, not interested. You're not welcome anymore. Just nations only. Uh, didn't consult us. The first I heard of it was from a major paper. Just give me a call on a Tuesday afternoon. Do you mind commenting on this press release from the UCI? I was like, I have no idea what you're on about. Can you send it through to me? Right. Uh, so they... Suddenly, they- they basically prevented you because you were su- successful or that you didn't kind of fit the mold where they haven't had it. I presume they haven't had that challenge before where someone just sort of rocks up of their own doing. Yeah, I, I think we we definitely rocked a few boats, uh, rattled a few cages, did things quite differently. We weren't structured like any normal team. We, we didn't have uh, this sort of management structure and coaches. It was literally... We did everything as riders. Uh, and I think there's a lot to be said for that of, of empowerment and having the ability to control your own destiny and not have this coach centric system where a coach determines the, the training you do, the strategy you ride, the races you go to. It was a case of, we know what we want to do. We've got all the, these ideas from, from our own studies and from our own life experiences that we want to apply um, and just see what comes out the other end. And as a team culture, we were probably quite different as well. We were very focused on I guess having good morale at all competitions and enjoying enjoying it really enjoying the journey we were in track center blasting out Gwen Stefani and <laughs> loads of other things that probably weren't so well received by by the, the sort of established system uh, and then yeah when you start beating them then uh, I think it, it kind of hit home with them and I don't know what happened behind the scenes so we can obviously uh, assume and guess but yeah effectively we, we didn't fit in with what they thought trade teams should be so the short decision was uh, yeah simply banners and get rid of us, um, which then inspired the next step of, I guess, my career to, to move in and help the Danish team towards Tokyo. Can, so can I just um, unpack a few different ideas there? Um, that you sort of created this sort of serendipitous picture yeah. of you just clubbed together and just had a bit of a ring round and then <laughs> you, you're you beating the... Uh, perceived establishment, the British cycling infrastructure, and it's a juggernaut of of highly developed infrastructure and systems there. But could you could you pinpoint in that sort of those formative stages what you felt were enabling success cr- criteria? That's a good question. So I think it's worth understanding the sport in its first instance, BC, especially British cycling, they, they target the Olympics and anything in between is experience or qualification. They're, they're not there to bring out their, their fancy kit every other week, because why would they, they, they want their competitive advantage. Although that being said, the riders obviously still want to win. They're not going to turn up and, and just boot around. So there were other nations who are much in, in the same ilk of that, that it wasn't always their A team or in the best form. So that's maybe me caveating that we were turning up trying to uh, trying to win every round because why wouldn't we? That, that was what we wanted to do. We just wanted to, to go fast and win stuff. I think the reason, maybe it was serendipitous, but I think the composition of the team, especially in the first instance, had such a broad skill base and experience base as well. We weren't 16, 17, 18 year olds coming into this. We were 24, 25, 26. We've raced domestically. We've raced internationally. We've got undergrad and master's degrees we've got a sports psycho we've got a psychologist in johnny we've got a sports physiology with tipper myself and charlie are engineers and i guess because we've all followed the sport so closely and quite critically at, at points as well we we saw where things we perceived were being done wrong so whether it was how athletes were were treated how they were coached how they were trained how practitioners were involved and their ability to implement their ideas with athletes and I think that's something that most practitioners can probably or are probably aware of that, that they can have some great research and if they can't have impact with it then it feels like you've not made that big step to, to high performance that you've got all this great stuff and it's it's wasting away uh, and that was like one thing that we really jumped on that there's so many smart people and Johnny laughed and joked that smart people on Twitter want to tell you how smart they are but that's such a great place to find all this this great research and people like uh, Lewis Goff with 
sodium bicarb supplementation. We had Medi with uh, a lot of stuff around uh, critical power and his uh, W prime. Uh, Steve Fortin with a lot of thermal physiology. Uh, Kerberg and Taylor came on board as well from Muffy Uni and helped on multiple different respects. So there's there's just a lot of people that we kind of pulled in and took on this journey and said, look, you've got these awesome ideas and we just want to go fast and we want to go fast quickly. We don't care about the Olympics in two, three years time. That's that's not for us. As things currently stand, we're not going to go. So let's just try and be as, as quick as we can and use that that knowledge to good effect. And I think that was, that was I'd say, fairly critical because you have these very intelligent people who understand the sport, but also see its flaws at the same time, come in and, and, and sort of have their input. And I think that that helped us a huge amount in the first instance, because we were pretty raw. We, we had some great ideas, but actually trying to distill those down into what was beneficial was sometimes a bit, a bit hard. And having someone who's maybe a bit more mature, a bit more experienced, I guess like a coach would be, uh, to come in and, and filter those a little bit was was helpful. Um, but those relationships evolved throughout the whole team to the point that sometimes it, it went the other way and they were asking us for thoughts and guidance and advice on either their studies or the, the, the roles they got involved with with other teams. So Medi was a great example. He's now um, one of the coaches at the Dutch sprint team who are the reigning world champions, world record holders and favourites for the, for the team sprint gold in a matter of four or five days time. Um, so hopefully that, yeah, it probably gives yeah. a bit of an insight. It's probably not the only thing, but. And um, I don't want this to be necessarily about British cycling as such, because, you know, who can argue with the success that that, that system has had over the, the decades? But but why do you think that emerges in teams where there's a sense of, uh, I guess, reluctance to be embracing a lot of those ideas, that that rawness, the the direct conversations that you might have with Medicordi or with Kurt Berg and Taylor, who you know, though, why do you think there's a, a sense of we've got a system, we're just we're just going to keep it as it is? I hate to say it, but uh, I mean I have said it before that maybe they just got complacent. I I do believe that their system was awesome. It was put simply class leading, world, world class when it when it started up. And they did some awesome things in the first two, even three Olympic cycles. But you need to you can't just expect to continually crank the same handle and continue to progress at the same rate. At some point things need to change because you will stagnate. Uh, and I recently read the book Who Moved My Cheese and I found that quite analogous to the the situation that they they were doing the same thing they always did and suddenly expected to get the same results but the world was catching up and effectively the head start they had was they understood physics nothing more much more to that and then were inquisitive enough to to understand and apply that in all areas of of cycling performance and since then every other nation is in that that time they were probably focusing a lot more heavily on on the physiology on nutrition on everything on the energy inside of the equation and ignoring the energy outside of the equation and then once that penny dropped or that's even Pandora's box, you could call it. Once that's opened, it, it can't be closed, and every other nation's suddenly aware that they can measure CDA, they can measure CRR, they can measure drivetrain efficiency, and they can do it really quite easily. And then suddenly you can go, oh, what happens if I do this, and what happens if I do that? And I think these British cycling were the first through the door with that, but maybe stagnated on the processes they went through and how broad they were being in their investigations because things like um, positioning, rider positioning, the the benefits are, are huge literally huge so you can take a rider in a very poor time trial position on the track spend a day with them and you could find five seconds even more in an ip and you think five seconds is years and years and years and years and years of training but it takes just a whole lot of testing and knowing to go in the right direction and sometimes as well accepting that what a rider might say of like oh i don't think i can ride in this position or saying oh i think this might be a bit unstable if you go too narrow on your armrest and making those concessions and saying well Actually, you might be a little bit unstable. That might cost you a little bit in distance, but you save significantly more in the aerodynamic side, or you can train that back. And sometimes you've got to take those the steps back to then move multiple steps forward. And I think that was kind of another respect that, that we were quite happy to do of go, well, okay, this not might be this might not be the most comfortable position, the most sustainable position, but it is the most aerodynamically efficient. And I know that once the CDA wins out, my aerodynamics don't respond to a stimulus. I can't just ride in a time trial position and get more aero. However, I can ride in a less efficient position and my physiology will adapt to that over time. And I think that was uh, one of the big breakthroughs that, that we went with of just 
do that. And yeah, in the first instance, you make a, a step back in performance, but over time you more than recover that and end up in a better situation. And it's sometimes that hesitance to move away from a local optimum to find a global optimum elsewhere. And that's quite hard to achieve in a system that wants confirmed improvements. So you can't just do a test, finish a test, go to a meeting of all the practitioners and say, okay, this has made the rider slower by half a second over 4K. They'll go, what are you doing? You go, but oh, they'll, they'll probably be faster in six months time, but we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's a couple of really interesting concepts there. The, the That one, maybe I'll come back to there about being prepared to go backwards in the short term so that you're building something that is longer term effective. And that's something I've, I've met a number of times in, in, in supporting athletes. And I, and I can understand the reluctance of a system. And certainly when you're coaching, I think there's, there's a, there's, there's that sense and need for uh, results. It's, it's almost like the currency by which you're judged daily and there's no sense of, you know, you see it in football all the time, you know, a couple of bad results and, and they're out as opposed to, well, we're going to try and build something different. And over the next couple of months and years, it's going to be a bit rocky, but bear with us. And, and someone having the foresight to go, OK, <laughs> I get that. Um, but I, I think there's a naturally, I mean, I've encountered it dozens of times where a system I suppose becomes clo- more more and more closed. They have this initial uh, spark and inspiration, and those those magical conversations that happen over a cup of coffee or a beer, where it's a couple of like minded people, or as you say, some differences of of uh, of personality and opinion that that spark and, and clash, but also progress. I remember the initial conversations with um, Andrea Wools, Andrea Cowder, Cowder at the time, and Peter Keane, and seeing them at Manchester Met University. And it was so infectious, the conversation. But I also remember different support teams where we're hungry and we're open, and then we become more and more closed don't want to mess about with this too much. We don't want to change it because we know if we follow that pattern, it probably leads to success. And it it almost requires a, you know, a problem, a, a failure, a, a loss to disrupt that again uh, in some ways. Yeah. Uh, and you need to ideally move before that loss or create the loss in a situation yeah. where it's acceptable to the end goals. So don't fail at the world championships, fail in a training session or fail in a, in a smaller competition where it's, it's not quite so important. I think the other thing is people, there's, there's multiple things to pick up there, but I think people struggle with being questioned uh, about their decisions. It, it sometimes feels like an offense to them to say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And just constantly he asks why, why, why to get to that kind of more base understanding. And kids do it all the time. They love asking questions and adults are like, oh, just be, keep quiet, stop asking this, this, and this. But they're so inquisitive. And I think we lose that at some point and just trying to keep that inquisitive mindset throughout and to constantly ask those questions. Because if you don't, then you, you are just going to stagnate because you'll then just revert to type and just continue doing the same old thing. And you're not going to continue to progress and someone else might be someone else might be asking those awkward questions that you feel oh maybe I don't know that person well enough maybe we don't have a good enough rapport for me to wonder why they're doing this or how they're doing that so we just kind of go back into our shells and it's more of a a culture thing than it is an actual problem with the system it's just not having that confidence and to to do it rather than making that the status quo and being happy to to ask questions we we quite literally bought bought all those those people in we're talking about so Mehdi and Kurt was a prime example he we, um, I think he just he emailed Watchup asking some some time trial related question, and I spotted in his email signature that he was a PhD researcher at Loughborough. I was like, "You're going to be really smart with loads of good ideas. Let's get you in." And just asked so many questions. It was like three or four hours. He came around for a coffee and just sat on the sofa. And by the end, he was like dripping with sweat. Like, guys, I've never I've never been questioned <laughs> like this before. That's good. Um, I'm glad. I, I, I used to, well, I used to ride with Kurt before he, he moved off. And uh, then move back up north. But um, I'm glad to hear that you made him sweat because I could never do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, for us, it was so 
such a great experience because you rarely, or at least we hadn't had these opportunities to ask such deep questions of somebody who would actually thoroughly understood it and understood the limitations of it and would happily put his hand up and say, I don't know on that. This is what I do know. And these are like the things that need to be researched and why. And yeah, sometimes they're dead ends, but actually sometimes they spark ideas of, okay, well, can we research that? Can we go in the labs and test that on ourselves? And there were so many people keen to do that. Lewis Goff was, was one and we kind of turned him from this, uh, he was doing the usual thing, studying an effect of, of how well, sodium bicarb worked. And we're like, well, actually, we want to understand how that works in competition. So what happens when we do our warm up and we have caffeine and we have carbs and we have to get off and go to the toilet and everything else that you wouldn't put into a, a properly structured scientific study. But for us, that was incredibly important. So then he went back and completely changed how he was going to do that study and just said, OK, we'll do it around 4K individual pursuit performance with the, everything that goes before it. So your normal breakfast, your normal warm up, everything else that, that ties in with that, because it, it might have an impact, it might not, but it meant for us that we had a practical output from his study rather than just a case of sodium and bicarb works, you should probably take it in this kind of dose this, this far out. It was unique to each person and just little things like that, but might not have been a massive benefit. It might have found us a tenth of a second or two tenths of a second, but there's plenty of races where we were pretty close on, on that kind of performance level that they do make a difference. And I know you're an engineer, but um, have, a, have a go at the social psychology there for me, because um, I'm, I'm interested to hear your uh, perception around how you sustain that culture of questioning um, over time. Because as, uh, in, in my experience, this natural rhythm of that is that it's really open to start off with, then it starts to close. And, and it's something we do a lot of work with, with teams to to sort of reignite that and, and sustain that. But what's your sense of how you might be able to keep that philosophy going? I wouldn't say it's easy. And I, I think we went through the same of, we had a, a bit of a close phase and the best thing was more different people coming in, different athletes who had obviously seen what we said before. And they came in with heaps of questions and fresh ones as well, that even we hadn't thought of. And um. It needs to be, I think, structured within everything that you do. So a lot of our question and answer sessions, even within the team. So we obviously had our own, our own backgrounds and quite often new things have come up, even in the news. Let's, let's say like um, some new piece of technology has been used by an athlete, a major competition pops up on Cycling Weekly and Tipper or Johnny or Will or anybody pops up at the dinner table going, why are they doing that? And then you sit down and you go, good question, actually. I don't know. Or it could be this or it could be that. Oh, and then it sparks this whole process off. So is this, I think... It happened quite naturally because one, we're inquisitive people, two, we love the sport, and three, we're all living together. So we had these more relaxed opportunities where everyone's guards down. It's not this formulated meeting where we're going to discuss how we keep keep progressing and how we keep asking these questions. It was a case of we're living with each other, we're riding with each other. You've got all the ups and downs of that, but you can ask those questions in a in a really chilled out manner. And I think that means it's it's a lot easier to be to be open and honest because it's just one friend asking another friend their thoughts on on a subject matter, on a piece of equipment, on a strategy, on some nutrition, um, and recommending things like podcasts to each other. That was a, a common thing. We've got a load of different group chats, not just within the track team, but also the road team that had again their own areas of expertise and interest. And suddenly it's like, oh, have you listened to this podcast on altitude training by this guy? And then you'll have a listen, it'll pop up with a load of ideas, and then suddenly you seed them to other people and you go out on a three, four, five hour zone two ride and you're chatting away about the pros and cons of it. And I think for us, we were very lucky to have that dynamic naturally within the team. Uh, it did struggle, I think, at the back end, this the third season, 2019-2020, uh, where I think, because maybe that was led by me asking and answering a lot of the questions because they, they viewed me as this sort of team principal, where I had so many other things on my plate, I struggled to probably be as uh, a thorough as I would have liked to have been and had previously been on all those questions, because more questions started coming, I had less time more of the things on my plates, suddenly plates are spinning and dropping. And you think, well, it matters more that I get the flights booked for this competition than it does that I do the research on this really interesting question that Will's brought to me. And I regret that in a way, but there's only a finite amount of time in the day and yeah. days in the week. And um, I look back and think there's a lot of things we could have done different and better because fortunately COVID's given us all a lot of time to sit and think and that was one of the reasons I wrote a book to take a step back and reflect on the past few years and, and trying to still that into some 
some uh, beneficial thoughts for others to use. And at the same time thought, well, yeah, I wish I'd done this a bit differently. I wish I'd done that a bit differently. I wish, I wish we hadn't taken on quite so many partners and just focused on a bit more of a, a tight area because it might have been more beneficial in the long term to just develop skin suits or just develop wheels or something like that, rather than trying to do 10 different projects and just go, we'll find a way to do it. We'll get it done because unfortunately, yeah, you do run out of time. Yeah. Okay. So you've, you've sort of half answered my next question, which is, I suppose, a little bit more into the engineering mentality of sorting ideas and unpacking an event, profiling your profiles against that and matching to see where the gap might be. But um, I suppose, and certainly for, from, I, I've been, I've been the wrong end of this as in as, as a scientist, I've said, what about this? What about this? What about the other? And I think for a coach, that's all right up until a point, and then it can get annoying, um, where actually it's a, a, a really important responsibility for somebody in support to filter that. To, I'm, I'm going to cut this idea. I'm going to review it. I'm going to cut it. I'm going to log it. I'm going to let you know I've looked at it, but I'm not going to promote it. And But now... I've got sort of signal to noise ratio being improved that here, I'm going to press this idea because I think this is really important. And this has now moved up the chart. I think we should put energy, resource, effort and income uh, attached to this as opposed to as just, as you say, spinning plates and dropping loads. How did you start to rationalize that? How do you start to sort of get on top of that particular principle? So there's multiple areas, I think, to that. Um, in the first instance, it was trying to understand the event in first principles, so you know what what is important and how important. So for us, it was really quite simple, especially nowadays with power meters and speed sensors and everything else, that you can break a team pursuit down into literally power going in and where your losses go on, on the way out. So you've got the biggest ones, you've got CDA, CRR, drivetrain efficiency. So how airy you are, how efficient your tires are, how efficient your drivetrain is, and then mass is a little bit important, but you can largely ignore it for, for more intensive purposes. So then once you know the relative importance of things and you can measure them objectively, so we know we can measure all three of those variables with, with a reasonable degree of precision and accuracy. Uh, it's then talking about, well, yeah, well, where do we see the low hanging fruit and trying to get an idea of how sensitive each of those variables are to different changes. So we know just from our own testing that it's the rider position is very sensitive, skin suits are sensitive, helmets are sensitive, but things like, uh, should we go into smaller details? There's, everything is sensitive to it, depending on where you are in the sport and, and, and how far you're trying to go forward. But for example, changing like the profile of the back of a saddle, probably irrelevant, might change how you sit on it a little bit, but from an aero perspective, it doesn't really matter. So it's a case of understanding where we think we should focus our effort based on our current understanding and knowledge of what's sensitive and what isn't. Uh, and what we have available as well easily. So tires, in the first instance, you buy what's available. We actually then kicked off a development cycle with uh, a tire manufacturer that actually proved pretty, uh, not actually all that fruitful. Um, it was time consuming uh, and we didn't really find much benefit really. Uh, and that was more of a reflection, I think, on how efficient tires have got and that larger manufacturers seem to have a, a stronger hold on that. Uh, in a good way, I think, actually, that you've got very consistent and, and high-performing tyres. But from there, it was a case of, okay, where do we focus our effort? What do we want to look at? Is it rider positions? Is it skin suit development? Is it air extensions? Is it cockpits? Is it cranks? And then going, okay, well, we're likely to find this amount of gain, and it's probably going to take about this amount of time. So rank that on basically time gain to effort, and then focus on the top ones. There was a few of the factors that came into play. Obviously, budget is not limitless and nor is nor is time uh, and then what partners could we partner with so instead of the usual okay we'll go out and buy a b and c it was a case of okay we think we want to develop x y and z so this company could be interested in that or they already make something similar let's go to them and say let's go on this journey together we want to make i mean a really good example there's loads of examples actually all, all over the bike but a really good one in the first instance is our wheels we knew that there was some gains to be had in wheels and in profiles we went to a British manufacturer, Walker Brothers, and said, look, we know you design the wheels in this way. If you change them in this manner, then we can test all the different profiles without much overhead from your end. We can tell you what we want to test. You can produce them. We'll do the testing. You've got all the numbers to show they're faster. We're happy because we end up with the fastest wheels. We then go and race. We get all the results as well. So you're in this winning situation where you get free R&D, free test results, and free results at the end of it. 
and then they've got a product that they can you know, take to market and, and be incredibly successful. And it was, and I think that that process we applied pretty much across the bike uh, for for the whole year, or for every single year. I think we we obviously went further and further up the tree of, of fruit and things got harder and harder to find and ended up significantly more individualized. Skin suits was, was a big one. Um, in our final year, especially, we, we worked alongside Vortec, who are a company down at Silverstone with Hoob, and we did um, so much skin suit development to the point where every single rider had not just a bespoke skin suit fit, but had specific fabrics and all manner of different differences across, across the suit because simply put aerodynamics are individual and we just needed to optimize on that basis and it was so time consuming that unless you're an olympic track cycling team you'd probably never undertake it but it was a case of we've picked all the other fruit we we can't really find much elsewhere so actually that was pretty high up on the whole effort to to benefit um ranking um i do think we developed a few blind spots throughout that entire process over the years there's a few things in the first instance we cast aside and said no we don't think there's anything in that and then since then the last 18 months I've had the opportunity to step back reassess a few of them and I've gone damn we definitely missed missed some lower hanging pieces here there and everywhere uh, can you give us a few yeah. examples or is, are there, is that still to be cashed uh, in on <laughs> <laughs> um I get, yeah, one example I can probably give uh, was, was crank set aerodynamics and what goes into making a fast crank set. So in the first instance, we were thinking primarily it's stiffness and you want a nice, clean aerodynamic surface. And there wasn't much more to it. We didn't think much on Q factor. We didn't think much on crank length adjustability. Uh, so that's one that, yeah, especially the last 18 months, I've, I've dug into a lot more over multiple athletes. And that's another benefit of, of working with the Danish Federation instead of just four guys you've got a whole federation's worth of athletes and under 23s and juniors that you can basically experiment on because they're happy to come in and error test and get some benefits and you can go okay well what happens if we do all manner of stuff that you know, normally wouldn't do what happens if you go really long and crank length or really short or change the q factor drastically and how does that interact with their uh, uh their body because they, they might be really tall and skinny or they have might have really large feet and you see trends across all of it because you've got this this big cohort that you can dig into which in some ways is a benefit in some ways is really frustrating because it makes you realize quite how individual all of these things are and then when you go back to the, the big squad who are off to tokyo then suddenly you've got a lot of work to do with a lot of athletes who are going to the olympics you don't have quite so much time as some 18 year old kid who's who's on his trajectory for la 2028 and you've got to do all this individual optimization um but by understanding that at least we knew we had to do it and we could have mm. then put a plan in place rather than getting to the olympics finding out afterwards oh we should have actually just had different everything on every rider we knew to do that but it was yeah a bit, a bit of a long-winded way to get there so can i just i'm just curious now um is that on the basis that, that an aerodynamic or aerodynamics around a crank set is that based on the similar sort of idea that um, about aero socks, i.e., that part of the body is moving pretty quickly. Um, so that, or it has, for example, on a uh, hundred meter sprinter, the foot is the thing that moves the fastest. Uh, in that sense, I think it's a multitude of factors. <laughs> um, frustratingly, that yeah, there's there's pedaling dynamics, and they vary. It's at power, and it's well, yeah, power, torque, speed. So. If you're fatigued as well, they might be differently. So you might pedal toe down or toe up if you're more fatigued or you're putting more power out or less mm -hmm. power out. And then everything is speed sensitive at the same time. So you, you might be trying to optimize around a team pursuit that for the Olympics are going to ride at 70 kilometers an hour. So you figure out their Reynolds number and then you realize, yeah, we can't aero test at that speed. How do you replicate that meaningfully? And if you were to go into the wind tunnel, you, you can't ride at 700 watts in the correct position in the wind tunnel, pedaling the right cadence, et cetera, because the dynamics are different, not least when you then start to think about the fact that your angles and pitch angles aren't the same in a wind tunnel as they are in a velodrome. And you've got all these compounding factors that frustrate, I guess, frustrate engineers. And then someone just goes, but does it matter? And in some cases, yes. In some cases, no, is the frustrating thing. But yes, you, we've, we've found some good gains on some athletes and on others not so. And I don't truly know the answer to all of that yet. It's it's on our checklist of things to do going forward after after Tokyo to try and dig into more detail. And that's what's, I think, been really quite nice as an engineer, that the more we test, the more we dig into it, the more we understand we don't really know a huge amount about exactly what's going on in interacting and 
just presents more opportunity though because if we've got this far off what we know already then we might be able to really take it a step further in Paris all right sorry I, I got drawn in then and now you've sorry <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but um <laughs> And if I get my head out of some of the detail then, um, I suppose the big principle here is not about scurrying around and doing lots of stuff, um, which I think actually a lot of people misinterpret the idea of of marginal gains in that sense, because you end up, as you say, stretching yourself too too thinly. Um, this this idea that you've framed within the book around well, the very the, the very title, start with the end in mind or at the end in mind, uh, of working your way back. And I mean, it resonated very strongly when I first saw that you'd written it from the point of view that I think that a lot of people think of sports science about going off and doing research projects. Oh, it would be interesting to test that, be interesting to test this. Whereas applied sports science, I think much more closely aligns to engineering in the sense that our job isn't to test different types of bridges it's to build the best bridge for that situation. We want a bridge. <laughs> we, okay, let's let's try and make a bridge. <laughs> uh, here's what we think is the best situation, as opposed to right. We're going to go and and just explore different types of bridges. And so, um, so that in itself as a guiding principle, you've um, really captured nicely in the book. Tell, tell me what motivated you to start writing. COVID, really? Oh, well, I actually, I take it a step back from that. Um, James Spackman, my literary agent, is a keen track cyclist, and he dropped us a message and said, I know you guys are traveling all around the world. Do you want a load of free books to read? And I was like, yes, <laughs> love a good book. Uh, so he fired a load in, which I think was intentional. He thought it'd be a good story to tell. And then, yeah, when COVID all came around, it was a great opportunity to put pen to paper. So uh, it was more about well, I think a lot of people originally wanted us to tell the sort of story of the team and in a sort of chronological format of we train like this and then we went to this race and this race and this race and that. Okay. For some people it would be interesting. For me, it was kind of that's been told. You can you can go on any website and find the results from a race and follow us on Twitter and Instagram, whatever else, and that's all fine. But it was more about telling the the things behind the scenes of how we went about what we did because it's that's hard to to get across in even in, in a podcast if you were to sit down for an hour and go through every kind of detail it's, it's it's you can you end up on all sort of rabbit holes and actually to sit down and put pen to paper and, and distill that down was I think quite just a nice experience for me to to think about and even my teammates uh, to then sort of get questioned on what they thought because things that happened two or three years ago you kind of view back in your own vision and what they experienced might have been a whole lot different uh, so that that was kind of the motivation really uh the the whole process to, to start at the end as it were was just i think natural to to an engineer to to look at the the demands of the event simple as that and i think that was always the approach we we knew what we needed to do it was just a case of figuring out how we do that uh and that same with with johnny and with with charlie and with tipper we we all had that engineering or scientific mindset and i think people view science as like a collection of knowledge you go on pubmed and you get some knowledge that's that's science but it's not it's that it's a way of thinking about how you go about something that's that's what science really is uh so just having that that mindset in everything you do and from an engineer's perspective i always like distilling it down into nice simple units of yeah of watts or frontal area or efficiencies well, rather than wishy-washy stuff that, that cycling sometimes been renowned for, I guess, of I mean, there's all manner of random metrics that have come up of VAM and this and that and the other, and you need to target if you want to win the tour, you need this VAM. And it's like, well, actually, no, you need this mass, this CDA, this CRR, this power, and depending on tactics and execution, you can really break it down into much more actionable metrics, things that you can actually measure and actually improve. And it's understanding the ones that you can measure because anything else that you measure that doesn't really impact directly on performance is pretty irrelevant and probably quite distracting to your, to your end goal. And it's far too easy in the modern world to measure all manner of things with you know, smart watches and <laughs> whatever else. And if it, if it doesn't give you anything actionable, then what's the point? I think uh, Johnny was a, was a great person for that within the team. He is skeptical of technology to say the least, especially things like, uh, yeah, smart watches and sleep trackers and core body temperature sensors in a good way, not in a, mm. just put them in the bin, but in a genuine, let's, let's approach this scientifically. What do they, what do they do? How do they do it? 
uh, and how does that actually benefit us in the long run? Because, for example, if you were to get a, a Whoop membership for a year for four guys on a team pursuit, that's quite an expense. That's basically one sixtieth of our budget. And if it doesn't actually translate to performance at the end of it, then it's, it's a waste of time if you can't do anything meaningful with the data. Whereas spending that thousand pounds on track aero testing or a wind tunnel session or a power meter or a no-show aero meter, whatever it might be, there's better ways to spend it. And it, that kind of comes back to that ranking system of where you're spending your time and your effort, because there's no point flooding yourself with all different manner of metrics if largely they don't really tie to the end goal of riding a in for us it was a 353 back then mm. and there's, there's a phrase in the in the book um where you're interested or you're you're being careful to sort of separate the results from the process uh, uh i think the phrase was was how did you get there as opposed to where are you at um what was the methodology what was the thinking or what was the 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 um the practice that you used and i I think that's a similar sort of discerning question that that i think a lot of people struggle to separate and particularly those that are successful as we've sort of alluded to when when you've yeah i remember having a conversation with an olympic champion of um of saying oh you you should have done this or this we should have done that in a debrief they said i won a gold medal (laughs) and it's difficult to it's difficult to sort of broach that conversation well yeah i suppose you did but um and and as you say you know you could chuck any everything at at these different these different ideas sleep monitors as as an example where actually the, the chances of you getting the wrong information uh, is relatively high and actually that could send you in the wrong direction and the, the net gain from a an additive technology like that uh, you have to be quite discerning uh, in terms of the value add as you're as you're starting to collect some of these ideas together and i think it depends on the person for things like sleep tracking for example if you're already a good sleeper then why mess with it if you, if you don't yeah. believe it's a, a bottleneck whereas a good example with, with jacob with tipper that he is a bad sleeper. He knows he's a bad sleeper. And it's not so much that the sleep tracker tells him he's a bad sleeper. It, it just holds him accountable because he knows yeah. he sees that number and he goes, didn't sleep very well. I know I need to sort that. I know it's bad last night. We're going to get to bed early tonight. And he was renowned for, for yeah, his, his poor recovery and poor sleep. And for him, that was a really, really useful tool. Um, but yeah, to, to jump into the whole process over goal, uh, yeah. I think that was something that I got frustrated with when, I spoke to, I mean, across so many sports where you'd come in and you have different ideas or ways of doing things or just just questioning, just the usual Socratic method, just asking these open-ended questions and drilling down. They go, well, why does it matter? We won Olympic gold or we won the world champs or we went faster than you. It's like, well, whether you did or didn't doesn't really justify the means. It's like you want to optimize the process, not just optimize or achieve the end goal. Okay, everyone wants to achieve great results, but if you're doing things wrong along the way then who's to say well you definitely can be better uh and i think for us it was a a bit of a no-brainer to just focus more on on the process side of things at least for myself personally it was easier to be successful on the things within your control rather than yeah pin your i guess everything your morale your uh value as an athlete on whether you ride a certain time at the end and again coming back to the objectivity if, if we broke down the team pursuit into hours at each position and drag coefficients and we can hit those numbers in training then we can be pretty confident that we'll achieve the time that we want to do when when competition rolls around and if something goes wrong then that's down to your execution and not you to to blame the process Um, maybe it's just down to poor modeling with me picking the wrong what's the cda target versus what people might achieve and that's just down to trying to make some good assumptions and guesses towards where other nations are in the trajectory Um, But that was actually a super useful metric for us. What's the CDA was, and it still is, the the gold standard method for for us analyzing and comparing athlete to athlete because it doesn't, it takes out power meter variance because you calculate your CDA from the power meter as well as your power. So we were literally reporting this for every single effort, for every training on a half lap basis. So you can see uh, he did five laps at three and a half thousand watts of CDA and he only did three or he picked it up at the back end because his watts of CDA went up. But then sometimes you go, oh, but your power went down, so you've got more aero. What are you doing at the back end of that turn that made you get more aero? You get all these really interesting insights just by having these metrics to focus on the process and not be worried about 
what comes out at the end, which for you in the team pursuit is literally how fast you ride. You actually, you control the controllables and ignore the end goal and hope that the processes on the way are, are what you think they should be. Yeah. And I think the, the critical aspect of that is that the thing a lot of people will forget that I'm keen to get your thoughts on is the, is having a clean way of assessing the result afterwards. So it's not just in the lead up in that sense of, I think a lot of people will do that hindsight bias or they'll, they'll start to all that glitters is gold narrative of we tried this, that and the other, and therefore it must have all worked as opposed to having a, um, a st- I suppose a decent review and debrief method. Is that something that you instilled in the team as well? Yeah, I think it's something that we all wanted, to be honest. Uh, we obviously knew other nations were doing analysis in different ways and have a, had a bit of insight into that, but then also just ran with the idea in that we we can measure all these different great things and how can we present them and um, what metrics can we create for ourselves. And yet yeah, to go back to the what's the CDA one, I, I still think that that was one that other nations didn't really jump on and maybe still haven't now, or maybe I'm giving the game away on that, but it was such a, a useful one because it ties both both sides together. It ties the energy in and the energy out and gives you a, a nice, clean, uh, useful metric. And the, they were always, it was, so we, we, we'd run a team pursuit session. It might be a Wednesday afternoon and we've been having to dodge around some vets on the session because we couldn't afford a private track time block. Um, and we finish and we run back home and, so you want to eat and put your feet up and recover and all I've got is everyone like you got the graphs done yet have you got the graphs done yet have you got the graphs done yet so it's downloading all the data and processing and that was something that was for me a, a big project just to, to streamline that process because it became such an overhead but you could see how how important it was and that the guys pinned their value then on a metric that really tied heavily with performance uh that for simply did their training work or their their change of helmet or change of whatever over the past week, two weeks since the last session, they could see how they'd moved on in a, in a meaningful way because it was pretty simple. We, we did that in training. If what's the CD went up or your turn length went up at the same target value, then we went faster. Um, and that's just simple, simple maths. It's not complex by, by any stretch. And it was nice and easy for the guys to look at and absorb. And they could then look at each other's as well. It wasn't like we were hiding any of the data from anybody. It was all one big group chat. It was the riders. It was all the, the support staff that helped us and Medi and Steve. And yeah, they, they all went in and everything was was open and people would discuss. And we, we had a good feedback system as well. So literally just um, a Google sheet where you went in and discussed each effort after it was, how did you feel? How did it go for you? Um, and what general feedback do you have? And just type it on in. Um, simple as that. It meant everyone could see what everyone else thought of the session. Everyone could see what everyone else did in the session. We had all the videos available. So it kind of tied it all together quite nicely. Um, so even though we were this small budget team living out of a student house, we had quite a quite a really optimized system for performance analysis and to really pull apart what everyone was doing in every effort, uh, which made, I guess, everything a lot simpler. We we could train to that. We could select riders based on that. It was all quite clear. We didn't have too many selection issues that I know is a, is a big issue in, in Team Pursuit for Nations that you could, well, if you didn't have those metrics, it was a case of, oh, you did better in this effort or worse in that effort, or you got dropped here or you kicked through or your line wasn't good or whatever might be held against you as an athlete. For us, it was, it was quite simple. We set out that that was the metric we were pretty much governed by uh, unless something else was drastically wrong. So you were... Now, let's say terribly inconsistent in the line you rode which might be held against you to, to say well it's it was harder behind you but then we had another metric for that as well we, we could see your variance of speed we could see your variance of torque application and we could see how efficient riders were drafting behind you so we could say well if you're on the front it's effectively five percent harder for man two three and four versus if someone else is on the front and then that's another metric you can compare one to another so it was literally a draft speed how much did your air speed reduce at each position so we could say ah well at at man two sorry man three or man four you might be at 27 or 28k an hour but he's at 32 so he's drafting much better than you what's going on how's that happening look at the video compare between athletes have a discussion what what are you doing what are you feeling on the bike how are you responding to changes in the line changes in pace uh, and just have those discussions as athlete to athlete and not have that coach in the middle deciding all these things. It was just more democratic, I guess. 
Okay, so I'm listening to you and I'm kind of um, hearing the specific tactics and the mechanics of of the the substance and technical aspect of the performance. But I'm uh, I've got this sort of uh, I'm drawn to an area that I was delighted that you wrote about in the book, so particularly on the back end about the diff- I guess the way in which the team ran, and so. I'm looking at simple abilities such as listening, uh, listening to people around you, uh, as opposed to telling people or just shouting at people, or, or as you alluded to, maybe an autocratic decision-making process. Um, and then I'm also reading aspects about the attitude, people bringing almost like a consultant attitude to the team, as opposed to job retention attitude. I won't rock the boat too much. I'll just keep things steady. I'll curb my thoughts and input because I, I want to sustain my contract. Um, what are your sort of, what are your big lessons from how the team needs to run? Because there's a lot about uh, team dynamics that you allude to. Yeah, that's a good question. There's, there's multiple levels to it and multiple people who are, uh if you call them accountable or responsible for the culture. It wasn't just one thing set by an autocratic leader. I think it was quite a fluid, dynamic thing that changed um, over the, the few years. But I think there was, I think primarily I'd say it was underpinned by the enjoyment of the sport. And I know that sounds like quite simplistic. Everyone enjoys sport, but it's actually just truly, actually just enjoying what you're doing, of knowing you, you want to be there because it's fun. And making sessions fun, making training fun, making living together fun, making going on these awesome adventures all around the world as a team fun. And I think that sometimes gets lost in high performance sport. You see athletes struggling, not enjoying it, and even to the point of, of mental health issues where they they don't feel they can be themselves. They don't feel they can have a laugh and a joke. And I know there's a time and a place for it. We weren't exactly going into these team pursuit efforts, cracking jokes and and riding with a just all over the place. It was it was when when it mat when performance matters, performance matters, and, and that's out the window. But when you're back in track center between efforts, you've done your analysis, then there's nothing wrong with having a laugh and a joke with each other and, and enjoying the, the whole nature of it. And there were efforts designed for, for bringing out the, the best in people in certain ways. And, and Johnny structured a lot of these to help me really in some ways when, he, when morale was up or morale was down, he was a good barometer for that to know who was in a good place and who wasn't. So we could, um, design efforts accordingly that suit specific athletes to, to help them realize they're not going as bad as they think they are, or to conversely, to, to put more stress on those who are going very, very well to make life easier on those who aren't. So there's this more harmonic um, culture consistently rather than people realizing, oh, I'm not going so well. And, and we try and expose that as a weakness. It was like, no, we, we want people to get around. We want people the best from people and to, to balance that accordingly. But no, I think, again, that was just more of a team thing that people were aware of how everyone else was doing because we were there all day, every day. It was You had to accept that your guard's down all the time. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but it's not something that particularly happens in, in team sports because you go into this performance environment for a training session and then you might be on your toes throughout for whatever reason because you feel like you're being judged or being marked or feel like this is a key session for whatever reason or the pressure's been put on. And then... Once you leave, you can relax and become your normal self. Whereas actually, it was all the time, all the time you're you're kind of just yourself anyway. Um, Trying to lose my track of thought a little bit on that well, one. <laughs> can, can can I ask you though? Because I, I'm still f- trying to find clarity in this area where systems evolve over time. They go from this sort of disorder to, without sounding like Emperor Palpatine, order and. When you've got that order and blueprint, there's a system that you follow and there's confidence and probability attached to to that. And then what you've described there is a much freer, fluid, um, that democratic ability to flex and adapt to an individual's needs and individual circumstances. Um, you know, I'm almost imagining uh, a warped version of what you've just described of let's manufacture some fun um, that, that sort of creates uh, happiness in the camp. Um, 
I, I'm I'm still struggling w- with this uh, as a as an idea myself about I think systems will move to order, but then you have to kind of disrupt them over time, as you've described. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that disruption as well is is what helps them to move on though to accept that they've kind of got stuck in a rut and, and need to change. Uh, I presented it as if like it was all uh, all roses all the time, and it definitely wasn't. By any stretch, we had times where we're in each corner of the lounge screaming and shouting at each other, "You've done this, and you've not done the washing, and you were terrible in this effort." And it comes back to just being open, being honest. And friends don't always get on, um, and we were friends, and I think that was a, a good thing for us. But um, nonetheless, the, there were hard times and times when we questioned each other and times when I felt that not everyone's pulling their weight, not doing things right. And it was just the fact of being open and honest with it and not bottling that up over the long term because that's that's not going to be a good thing for the performance. Um, I do think, again, we, we drifted towards that audit structure in that final year where I didn't have the time, per se, to, to get involved on the same level. And um, the, there was another dynamic issue that, that evolved where basically instead of four or maybe five guys, suddenly we have six guys. And you can only name five for a squad. So not even we're in the situation of who's the starting four. We're like, who's the five we even enter for this race in four weeks time. And that was a different dynamic that it did become toxic is definitely the wrong word because it was never toxic, but it was, it was tension at points within the team because they could, they could feel that. And it was, it was a hard thing to manage. And it's, it, it definitely is a hard thing across all teams, how, how you value a rider when it's, especially in a democratic session is hard. Whereas a coach is very easy because they just go, this is what I'm judging on, whether it's right or wrong. And this is how I'm, I'm going to judge you and when I'm going to judge you. Uh, I don't agree that's the best system, but equally I don't believe our system is something that could easily be employed in every NGB worldwide. It, there are multiple ways to, to approach that performance problem and ours evolved quite naturally and was quite productive, or at least in the first instance, and then became harder and harder to manage as it grew and evolved. And we couldn't stick to the, those founding principles when there's more riders, there's more races, there's more pressure. Uh, and even down to the point of efforts, if you're doing a team pursuit, you're doing four efforts, you've got six guys, how do you even structure that? And even if one sits out to do some specific efforts, or can't be there for whatever reason, it's still down to five. And it was it was hard. Um, and I don't think there was an easy answer to it. I think we did the best we could at the time to, to try and balance all that out to provide equal opportunity across them. And people were open and vocal about it. Um, Kyle was probably on the receiving end because he was always not quite at the same level as Will, who they both come in at the same time. And Will was just performing just a slight bit better than him at all the time. So as much as Kyle is, is a great friend and continues to be a great friend, we had to be open and honest with him and just say, look, you're not performing at the level required to be in the starting team. Like, this is what you need to do. These are all the metrics. Like, this is how we're judging people. You just simply need to improve whether that's, do you need a coach? Do you need a different coach? Do you need to do some totally other different intervention? Like, it was all there. He was he was empowered as an athlete to do what he needed to do, but at that point in time, just wasn't capable of achieving what we wanted from the athletes to sign on the start line. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's always a cold aspect to that, isn't there? There's, someone's going to miss out on selection. Someone's going to miss out on a medal. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, it often goes down to having an agreement up front about how you're going to engage and, and work with each other, that you're all signed up to the kind of standards of behavior, the way you talk to each other and so on. Um, look, last last question for me. I, I, I think that my favorite phrase, and I, and I read, read it and I thought, why didn't I know about this, um, was happiness what's. Um, so I need a bit of happiness Watts in my life, but it, 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 it'd be great if you could just, um, share the kind of insight behind it. But for, for ages, uh, I think part of my role as a coach or a sports scientist or a team leader is, is to look after the person, but also as much as anything from a performance point of view, as in the best prescription I might give is go to the cinema, go and get a pizza and chill out <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and change the hormonal profile uh, about not getting too wound up about what they're doing, but happiness, what's gone. Give us, give us the, the background to that. So yeah, or well, the concept I, uh, or the, the anecdote that I used in the book was around Rowan Dennis, who mm. anyone who follows cycling knows he's, he's had his highs and his lows and 
he seems to perform wildly different depending on his, his state of mind, put simply. And his coach put it down to, to happiness was when he was happy and content, when he could see his family, when he felt he had balance between the training he had to do, the family and the social events that he wanted to attend, the races he wanted to do, the racing style he wanted to embrace and the races to focus on and the equipment even that he wanted to use. And they all feature heavily in, in that whole balance of, you've got this finite amount of time, these finite events, you want to squeeze everything from that and not also feel that you're missing out on your best friend's wedding and your child's first day at school or whatever it might be, because cyclists are on the road a lot. They are out and about. Um, I think we didn't feel so much that we felt left out because we were living with mates. We felt like we were a bunch of students in some ways. They were just a, a, a university hall, but with Rowan, it, it was it was clear he would perform terribly. And then when he, he did, find that harmony, that balance, he was performing incredibly well. And I think that showed last year with, with Ineos Grenadiers that he found happiness within that system and suddenly was performing literally at the top level across, uh, was it the Giro d'Italia where he was helping Theo Gegenhart take the win? Um, and then you kind of rewind it back 12 months and he'd had a terrible time at, uh, at Bahrain Merida, it was back then, where he'd literally, middle of the stage race, Tour de France just before the I want to say it was stage 13 individual time trial where he was a huge favourite as world champion got off the bike got in the team car and went home which was it was crazy and that was just an um, I think it was equipment I want to say it was a skin suit that he was unhappy with that he'd been to the wind tunnel tested and had to ride in a specific suit that was a lot slower um, and he said well what's the point I'm world champion and I sit on the start line with a 20 watt handicap I'm not going to win <laughs> so that was that unbalance uh, and yeah, it's, it's finding that balance in life and, and being content with everything that you're doing and don't feel like, oh, I wish I was here. I wish I was there. I wish I was doing this race. I wish I was racing in this style. Um, and everyone will have regrets to, to varying degrees. And it's just, I think it's just trying to be aware of what you're trying to, to get from the sport and what you want to be doing day to day and to enjoy that process and not just derive your happiness from an end goal that isn't within your bounds of control to actually just say, well, I enjoy going out and riding with my mates. I enjoy uh, doing these kind of races i enjoy targeting this style of time trial i enjoy doing a team pursuit in this style with my friends and simple as that that that's where your, your sort of happiness comes from and if you're happy then you tend to perform uh I mean, johnny is a is a great case of that so johnny's bipolar and when he's down he's down and literally struggles like it because he uh he can't fire anywhere near as, as powerfully as he as he would when he's on a high and that ebbs and flows and competition sort of shortens that cycle. So he could be on a, on a terrible low and doing a, having a terrible session and it affects his mood. It affects everything about how he, who he is as a person. And we laughs and jokes and calls himself the chief morale officer of the team. But when he is on a high, then that is absolutely his role and it washes off on everyone else in the team. And he can do some ridiculous numbers that he would could only dream of if he was in his normal state and for him that's basically a superpower it's a bit of an advantage um but keeping him happy was very critical to the performance of the team on on race day uh, i think that was this, the same across the board but he was definitely an extreme example of that mm. i found it a really powerful section in the book actually um just this just this idea and this discrimination between the two two aspects or two stages of a, a, a cyclist's career they might struggle with when they first get on the team and then when they've got had children and and I think that just speaks to stage potentially age but but also the, the level of challenge when there might be a middle bit where you can just tuck into it you know you don't have you don't have to prove yourself you you haven't got other as many as responsibilities back at home and so you're able to give that that particular dial full bore but to to get the other dials in order i think um is critical and it, and it speaks to probably a much more sophisticated way and a, a probably a uh, a much more compassionate way about how we support athletes in at different different stages in their career yeah uh, the compassionate side as well i think is one that's often overlooked within ngbs and that's why athletes have, have had blow ups and struggles because it's, at least in, in well-developed systems that don't recognize that and coaches who maybe don't have the, the best rapport with athletes don't have that insight into their lives and to understand everything else that's going on and athletes can bury it and see that as a weakness that they're like look I, I really can't come to this training session because I've got to go and do this that and the other and you feel like you're being held accountable you're, you're being judged and 
when when selection comes around, oh, you're you're going to be the reserve rider because you had to skip that training session six months ago. And I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. And I think athletes are really worried about putting a foot wrong when when being viewed within those kind of systems. Um, and it can be pretty pretty destructive. I think um, I don't want to name names and, and point fingers, but uh, I've definitely seen and experienced that with with athletes that I know of. And it it looks it's career destroying pretty pretty much because they can't do what they want to do and in the it cuts cuts them short in the long term because they don't have that long-term balance that they need to to sustain a career well into their, their 30s or even beyond so yeah if you want longevity then you need to be happy because you spend a, a big chunk of your life on these projects if golden projects on careers then you want to be happy and content in everything that you do and ensure that you're not missing out on other stuff because you'll only live to to regret and resent those decisions brilliant dan i I really appreciate your um insights i think that you are striking out as a really important presence in in sport and and sport and performance and how we as you go about what we do and i think you raise so many so many critical questions that that we should be willing to to ask of ourselves and, and review about how we're we're creating performance and it's a brilliant book i'd recommend it to to anybody so thank you so much dan no, I thoroughly appreciate the time to chat. It's, it's always enjoyable to, to dig into these concepts in a bit more detail and, yeah, put a, bit, a bit more into the background behind um, how they came about. So thank you.